All right, ladies and gents, we're back. Welcome. Book review. I'm going to try to do a book review. I've been wanting to tell you about this book, to share this book with you and with you since I read it. I recently read it. I've been meaning to read it for years, and I finally did it. This book is called When Breath Becomes Air by Paul... I think you say Kalanithi, Dr. Paul Kalanithi. This guy was a, a, a Stanford neurosurgeon who in the middle end of his re seven year residency was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, stage four lung cancer. And he writes this book as literally as he's dying of cancer. I mean, it's so intense. Um, and I've been meaning to just read it as a doctor myself. Like, what does another doctor think about his own mortality and death and going through a terminal disease? And what is it like to be in, to be on the other side of the stethoscope, so to speak? And um, it's a great book. I'm gonna tell you about the book in a second. When I hit 39, uh, I'm 41 now, so a couple years ago, it's before 40. The midlife crisis came in. And <clears throat> I had this realization. I was like, God, you know, I'm 40. The average age, average life is going to be about 80. Let's just say it's 80. My life might be half over. And it really messed with my mind. And, I, and I've thought a lot. I've always thought a lot about death. But I thought a lot about death then, too. And... Um, I've come to appreciate time. I come to, that my values are, you know, you value time more. So that happened. And then in the ER, people die all the time. And, and there's always this opportunity to reflect on life and what does it mean? And what, what does your life mean in the context of your death? It really grounds us as human beings. But the irony is that nurses and doctors, all of us run around, and I think most of the time, we don't think about death. We kind of are in a little bit of denial, and that's part of how we cope with this massive, profound concept of it being over, life coming to an end. But, and, and so, you know, why did I pick this thing up now? I, I think with COVID, there is even, it's made me reflect even more on death. And so I wanted to pick up a book that is written by a doctor about his own death. So I'm going to read some of some, just some things I underlined. I just want to kind of go and share that with you. That's going to be my book review. If you're in a place where, where that sounds like something, I mean, this is not for everybody at every time, right? <laughs> like a deep, sad, I mean, I cry, I, I cried a lot in this book. I'll tell you why in a minute, but um, it's a, it's a, it's an, an, kind of an intense moving book. It's not for everybody at every time, but this is going to be my, my book review of it. Um, he divides it up into two parts. Part one, in perfect health, I begin. Part two, cease, cease not till death. The, the first part is him, kind of a memoir on his medical career up until the point where he gets sick. And it talks about his interest in being a neurosurgeon, kind of the intersection of neuroscience and neurobiology and the mind and, you know, just the existence of how, how all of us, so much of us kind of comes in through our brain. I mean, the brain is a material thing subject to the laws of physics and everything, but we still consider ourselves to be human beings where there's elements of choice and volition and randomness. And is it just all determined by what's going on in our brain? Or are we actually, is there actually a person, us, in there that's kind of making these um, decisions? We're more than just the matter, you know, we're more than just the cells and the sodium and the fat that our brain is directing all this stuff. Anyway, it's it's fascinating to part one, he goes through his, what interested him in medicine and, and, and kind of who he was before this illness. 
which the most fascinating parts of all of it is when he gets deep on his patients dying and he starts philosophizing on that. And there's such a buildup through the first part of the book. It's just, I sat there and I was like, wow, he has all these reflections on the death of his patients. And I was like, what about your own death? You know, like, so so how did that shape now your experience as, you, as he's going through this as a human being and as a physician and then and as a patient okay and then the second part is about his death he's married he talks with his wife about because they wanted to have kids and he's only got who knows how much time right months maybe a year or two if he's lucky, don't know how much time he's got. And he's like, should we have a kid? Like on the one hand, that would be like, that would be the love between them that lives on. On the other hand, he's like, I don't want her to be burdened by raising a child when I'm not there. What would you do? Like if you were married and you wanted to have a kid, somebody was terminally ill, like would you, and you could, would you go through with that? Knowing that the kid's only gonna have temporary time with their father, not even remember. Uh, it's making me emotional just talking about it. All right, let's see what I underlined. It's very easy to be number one. Find the guy who is number one and score one point higher than he does. He's talking about if that was the price of medicine, it was simply too high. He's talking about his father, who was a doctor who worked too much. And he ended up turning to medicine himself. The most intoxicating thing I'd ever experienced by far was the volume of romantic poetry she'd handed me the previous week. And so he talks about his love for literature and writing. And so he ultimately, like, this was kind of a, something he always wanted to do, was write this book. I was driven less by achievement than by trying to understand in earnest what makes human life meaningful. Coming from somebody who's dying of lung cancer. I'm just gonna share these kind of random things I underlined and, and reflections. If the unexamined life was not worth living, was the unlived life worth examining? That's that Thoreau quote. Um, the unexamined life is not worth living. As a writer, I really appreciated his writing because it was clear and it wasn't too flowery. He wasn't like writing and like demonstrating like, oh, look at me, I'm a great writer. He had a, a way of communicating what he was feeling and his ideas that really were, made it kind of tangible for the reader. That's like, that's good writing, you know. Um, I studied literature and philosophy to understand what makes life meaningful and studied neuroscience and worked in an fMRI lab, functional MRI lab, to understand how the brain could give rise to an organism, us, capable of finding meaning in the world. It's crazy, right? Like at some point we went from lizards to mammals to apes to this meaning being that we are. And he was fascinated by that. I love that stuff. He became a neurosurgeon. Hadn't Whitman himself written that only the physician could truly understand the, psych the ph physiological spiritual man. You know, this dual... We're animals. We have a, a body, but then we also have these additional parts of us that are spiritual and, and emotional, and there's more to us than just the bodies. Page 43. I find myself increasingly often arguing that direct experience of life and death questions was essential to generating substantial moral opinions about them. All, this is this is a great little bit, page 49. 
All of medicine, not just cadaver dissection, trespasses into sacred spheres. Doctors invade the body in every way imaginable. They see people at their most vulnerable, their most sacred, their most private. They escort them into the world and then back out. Seeing the body as matter and mechanism is the flip side to easing the most profound human suffering. Nuggets. The first birth I witnessed was also the first death. He's talking about going through medical school and I think he delivered a baby that, uh, that was a preemie twins that didn't make it initially. And so as he, you know, he's talking about his transformation as a person from medical school and residency, you know, going not only from this kind of prepubescent med student into this incredibly powerful neurosurgeon to save lives, but then also as he as a human being is being transformed by these experiences with people and then ultimately by his own, his own illness and death. It's kind of the final transformation. And, and, and let me just say this, this, the whole point of his whole book, the way that he writes it, the, the reason that it is, that it was celebrated and well done and gripping is because the whole time you're reading this and you're experiencing kind of what it's like to be a neurosurgeon a little bit and, and what it's like to be him sick and dying of lung cancer and grieving and going through all of that stuff. But really what it's doing is in the back of the back of your mind, you're thinking, what's this going to be like when I die? How am I going to take make meaning out of my life and what I've done and reg regrets and and all of it? And I think kind of going on this journey with him as much as we can is a profound window, door, you know, way to explore for ourselves what what does your own life mean in the context of your death and it's it's like subtle but not subtle you can kind of embrace that and look into it more or you can just kind of read the thing and be like oh he's the one dying i'm not dying right we're all dying we're all dying i was a prophet returning from the mountaintop with news of a joyous new covenant it's talking about when he would give good news. One day we were born, one day we shall die. The same day, the same second birth, astride of, of the grave. The light gleams in an instant, then it's night once more. Samuel Beckett, that's who he was quoting. Talking about making tough decisions in medicine, surely intelligence wasn't enough. Moral clarity was needed as well. Somehow, I had to believe I would gain not only knowledge, but wisdom too. After all, when I'd walked into the hospital just one day before, birth and death had been merely abstract concepts. Now I had seen them both up close. I like his, you know, we don't use the word moral a lot, but I really like the way that he reminds us of the importance of who we are and decision making. Did he end up having a child? Um, I'm Oh, so about spoilers, I'm going to spoil it. I'm going to go through this whole, this is going to be a book recommendation and I'm going to take you through the whole on page 69, there's 220 pages on here. So if you don't want a spoiler, then you're, you should not do this at some point. But, but that's the whole, you know, going into this book that he dies. The book was published posthumously after he died. So, and, and we'll see as we kind of go through this a little bit and work our way through it. 
his ability to ride, I think, is a little bit compromised. Um, you see some of his disease show up in his writing in the course of the book. Um, I think t I think he died. This was I think he died in 2015, like maybe five years ago, and it was published a year or two after he died. His wife kind of continued with it. Published in 2016. I think he died in 2015. But that's not a spoiler. That's known. I mean, this is a... Let me see if I can tell you. I mean, it was... His wife writes an epilogue uh, that will bring you to your knees. <laughs> I mean, it's just terrible. It's really, really sad. Paul died Monday, March 15th, March 9th, 2015. So he died about five years ago, and this was published like a year after he died. Um, we'll get to did he have a kid or not. Putting lifestyle first is how you find a job, not a calling. I kind of agree with that, but that also sounds like a workaholic medicine. I was compelled by neurosurgery with its unforgiving call to perfection. Neurosurgery residents aren't just the best surgeons, we're the best doctors in the hospital. I don't know about that. Neurosurgeons are incredible physicians. Are they the best? I don't know about that. I lost my first patient on a Tuesday. I remember the first patient that died when I was in medical school, too. You, you know, I think when it first happens, you have this feeling of, oh, my God, did we do something wrong? You know, did we screw something up? And this kind of shame. And, and there are a handful of patients where I, I would have that reaction you know, you know, question everything. Go back and look over everything. Sometimes it's people's time. Sometimes things take a turn for the worse, even though you're doing everything right. And sometimes you don't do everything right. Um, that's an emotional thing to work through. It's heavy. So he starts talking about... Again, he's still in his development as a med student and as a resident. He's talking about his, you know, beginning experiences with death, especially with the responsibility of caring for people in that time and the burden of that. As my skills increased, so too did my responsibility. I found that to be profound, not just in medicine where it makes sense as you progress through med school and residency and you're able to take care of people. Um, you get more responsibility, but that's kind of a true thing in life, right? As you can do more, you should. You know, I think there's a should in there like that. I came to see, he's talking, so in this part he's talking about people and patients who are close to death but were able to save them. And it really makes you wonder sometimes if that technology and that power and all that, if that's the right thing to do or if we should just let people go, you know? I came to see this, keeping people alive kind of artificially, as a more egregious failure than the patient dying. Because people suffer. Because people suffer... Um, because people suffer when we keep them alive with terrible qualities of life. There are worse things than death. I agree with him there. Neurosurgery attracted me as much for its intertwining of brain and consciousness as for its intertwining of life and death. I had thought that a life spent in the space between the two would grant me not merely a stage for compassionate action, but an elevation of my own being. Getting as far away from petty materialism, from self-important trivia, getting right there to the heart of the matter, to truly life and death decisions and struggles, surely a kind of transcendence would be found there. But in residency, something else was gradually unfolding. 
In the midst of this endless barrage of head injuries, I began to suspect that being so close to the fiery light of such moments only blinded me to their nature, like trying to learn astronomy by staring directly at the sun. That's nice, right? That's just kind of enjoyable reading to read through and it communicates the idea. It's the same thing that I was saying earlier about working in the ER and being so close to death, you have the opportunity to kind of dig in and take a deep bite of it, as much as you want. But I think a lot of us kind of do this, the patient is the one with the disease, they're the one dying, even though we're sort of in the same boat eventually. I was grabbing my typical lunch, a Diet Coke and an ice cream sandwich. Doctors are terribly unhealthy. <laughs> I eat like shit in residency. I eat way better now. He gets called, he gets called to the ER, possible brain coming out of his nose. Crazy, right? Like who lives a life where that's a normal thing in your day? I don't, I've never seen brain coming out of somebody's nose, by the way, in my time in the ER. I don't work in the trauma center. After 30 minutes, we let him finish dying. With that kind of head injury, we all murmured in agreement, death was to be preferred. Again, like, it's building. The more that he reflects on this and is talking about it, the more I'm like, what does he think about his own death? For those of you that have joined, I'm doing a book review, When Breath Meets, When Breath Becomes Air by Dr. Paul Kalanithi, who um, was a neurosurgeon at Stanford who wrote this um, as he got terminal lung cancer in the middle of his residency. And so this guy is dying and he's writing this book about his life and all these reflections, and it's great. All of my occasions of failed empathy came rushing back to me. The people whose suffering I saw noted and neatly packaged into various diagnoses, the significance of which I failed to recognize. It's really easy to get um, stuck in just being clinical and not allowing some heart and soul to feel people, to feel their stories, to understand the context of who they are and what it means to them when they die in their own story or when their family member or loved one dies. And it's no surprise that as he's going through his own treatment as a patient, that he's seeing, that he's seeing this differently. Utterly missing the larger human significance. I feared I was losing sight of the singular importance of human relationships, not between patients and their families, but between doctor and patient. And there's no place for the scalpel. Words are the surgeon's only tool. So true for so many of us when we can't fix it. The families who gather around to their beloved, the beloved whose sheared head contains battered brains, they do not usually recognize the full significance either. This is the profound stuff. This is this life and death profound stuff that I'm talking about, and he digs a lot of it out. It was the, had I been more religious in my youth, I might have become a pastor, for it was the pastoral role that I've sought. It's interesting for, and I've fed this, you know, for many people, the time with the doctor is with us is almost the confessional. You know, they'll tell you, tell us things they don't tell anybody. And we, you know, keep it quiet and confidential, but it's a, it's a very privileged, special place where people will let down their guard and be real. And it is very priest-like, pastoral. He's talking about brain cancer, which is not the kind of cancer he had. He had lung cancer. Cancer in the brain suggests death within a year, maybe two. And, and this is another one of these, like, 
every time he says one of these things, I'm like, what do you think about that? <laughs> like, what do you think about that now, having been somebody with cancer and a patient? Um, when talking about how to give this bad news, how to break this bad news to a patient, he says, it's important to be accurate, but you must always leave some room for hope. It's so, that's, it's so true. It's such a balance of, I'll have these times when people will just straight out ask, Doc, how much time do I have? Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you know it's not long. And it's a really difficult thing to balance talking about because people can get flat out depressed. But, um, but I agree with him, you know, especially when you're asked, you have to tell the truth and be honest about it. But in that, there is always positive to focus on. And one of the positives that I always tell people, especially when they don't have very much time, is you've got time. People die, drop dead of heart attacks, sudden cardiac arrest out of the hospital and they're gone. We don't get them back. Car, you know, people can die all of the sudden. As sad as it is for folks who do have two, six months a year, you've got they've got more than some people who just go um, in the middle of the incredible loss and all of that that is something to be thankful for and to take advantage of problem is you can't tell an individual patient where they sit on the curve openness to human relationality does not mean revealing grand truths from the apps it means meeting patients where they are and the narthex or nave and bringing them as far as you can. There's some fancy words in there for me, but um, yeah, you meet people where they're at. I agree with that. The call to protect life was obvious in its sacredness. Boy, as a doctor in this COVID stuff, I've really felt that, you know, to speak for people. This one really struck me. He, this was a friend of his that he was close to who ended up dying of a terminal disease before he had. It's a guy he looked up to and he said, the, his friend said to him, Paul, do you think my life has meaning? Did I make the right choices? It was stunning. Even someone I considered a moral exemplar had these questions in face of mortality. Again, like, this is the guy talking who's dying of lung cancer. The pain of failure had led me to understand that technical excellence was a moral requirement. Boy, there's nothing that teaches better than that kind of failure, you know? Um, I'm going to get through this and then we could do a little chit chat with some questions or comments for you guys. If you're just joining, I'm doing a little book review, trying something fun and new. When Breath Becomes Air, Dr. Paul Kalanithi, uh, a neuro Stanford neurosurgeon who was diagnosed and died of lung cancer. This is his memoir. He's writing this as he's sick with cancer. Death comes for all of us, for us, for our patients. It's our fate as living, breathing, metabolizing organisms. I had trained for years to actively engage with death, to grapple with it, in so, and in so doing, to confront the meaning of life. He just like, leaving it out there. I'm like, what is the meaning of life? You're right in that throw, in that saddle. You know, tell me. Now he gets into, so this is page 120, and he starts to talk about he was diagnosed. He had had, you know, he's in the middle of residency, working a ton. And he had lost a ton of weight. I think he said he'd lost like 40 pounds or something ridiculous. 
if you have that much, if you have unintentional weight loss, it's such a big red flag. Go in and get checked. Um, I don't want to die. I told my wife to remarry that I couldn't bear the thought of her being alone. Ugh. I'm just, this is the, I'm gonna just read this little part. This is the beginning where he's first diagnosed. Lying next to Lucy, that's his wife. In the hospital bed, both of us crying. The CT scan image is still glowing on the computer screen. That identity of, as a physician, my identity, no longer mattered. With the cancer having invaded multiple organ systems, the diagnosis was clear. The room was quiet. Lucy told me she loved me. I don't want to die, I said. I told her to remarry that I couldn't bear the thought of her being alone. I'm never coming back to this hospital as a doctor. One chapter of my life seemed to have ended. Perhaps the whole book was closing. Severe illness wasn't life altering. It was life shattering. My carefully planned and hard won future no longer existed. Death, so familiar to me in my work, was now paying a personal visit. So he goes to meet his oncologist and he says, Basically, he wants to know his how much time he's got. What's his prognosis? I want to talk about the Kaplan Meyer survival cruise. No, absolutely not. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I agree with that. I think she should have given him some basic numbers. And then he says things like this that just tear my heart out. I sat staring at a photo of Lucy and me from medical school, dancing and laughing. It was so sad, these two planning a life together. Unaware, never suspecting their own fragility. Oh, it's making me tear up. talks about one of the things that struck me, he's talking with his oncologist, was, I mean, this is the question to all of us. If you got uh, a terminal disease like this, what would you, what would you do? If you had six months, a, a year, a couple years, and he's talking to her about working. And the oncologist, her guidance was, is it important to you? You know, you're gonna find your own values through this. How important is it? To you to work I feel like the answer is stop working travel the world live the bucket list and what he did was he finished his residency got back in the OR he got responded to a treatment he you know for many months I began to realize coming in such close contact with my own mortality had changed both nothing and everything. Before my cancer was diagnosed, I knew that someday I would die, but I didn't know when. After the diagnosis, I knew that someday I would die. After the diagnosis, I knew that someday I would die, but I wouldn't, didn't know when. But now I know it acutely. The problem wasn't really a scientific one. The fact of death is unsettling, but there's no other way to live. And even though I no longer really knew what it was, I felt it, a drop of hope. Any part of me that identified with being handsome was slowly being erased, though in fairness, I was happy to be uglier and alive. That was a man I no longer was. At best, I could aim to be him again. You have to figure out what's most important to you. It was up to me to find my values. Like my own patients, I had to face my mortality and try to understand what made my life worth living. And I needed Emma's help to do so. That's his oncologist. Torn between being a doctor and being a patient, delving into medical science and turning back 
to literature for answers. I struggled while facing my own death to rebuild my own life or perhaps find a new one. Now is experience of being a patient. When you get an IV placed, for example, you can actually taste the stalt when they start infusing it. That's why you call it normal saline. They tell me this happens to everybody, but even after 11 years of medicine, I'd never known. Outside the oncologist's office, I no longer knew who I was. Should Lucy and I have a child? Lucy and I both felt life wasn't about avoiding suffering. The, divining, the defining characteristic of the organism is striving. The easiest death wasn't necessarily the best. That was interesting. So thinking about, talking about what they wanted to do about having a kid. So here's this guy, he's got, who knows, a year or two maybe. Are you gonna try to have a kid that's 10 months? Is he even gonna be alive for the birth? And then if he is, is he gonna last that? Is he gonna last past that? Um, God, that's intense. In making a decision of should we have a child or not. Oh, I lost my page. Where was I? Spoiler. They decided to have a child. There had been a clear, dramatic reduction in tumor burden, so he got better. Even though he's got stage four lung cancer, it had spread, he got on the best treatment, and it got better. My senior peers were living the future that was no longer mine. Early career towards promotion, new houses. You know, that was his future, and now he's, he's not going to make that. Who, who would I be going forward and for how long? Hemingway described his process in similar terms. Acquiring rich experiences, then retreating to cogitate and write about them. I needed words to go forward. That's true, right? Like, get out there, live your life. And then you reflect on it and write about it and, and you, you make the significance. You understand the meaning and the significance in it. That morning I made a decision. I would push myself to return to the OR. Why? Because I could, because that's who I was. Because I, I would have to learn to live in a different way, seeing death as an imposing itinerant visitor, but knowing that even if I'm dying until I actually die, I'm still living. So he went back to work. He spent his last months, act, you know, able-bodied months, working as a neurosurgeon. I, this is his oncologist. I don't know how long you've got, but I will say this. The patient I just saw before you today has been on Tarceva for seven years without a problem. Looking at you, thinking about living 10 years is not crazy. You might not make, but it's not crazy. Uh, I, seven years, 10 years, <clears throat> that's like less than 5%, you know? I think that's too much fancy talk. I don't know what you guys think about that. I think that's, I don't know that I would say that. That's too much. I think that's false hope. Just my opinion. People always ask if it, being a neurosurgeon, being a doctor, is a calling, and my answer is always yes. You can't see it as a job because if it's a job, it's one of the worst jobs there is. <laughs> oh, it's that bad. The itch to hold a surgical drill again had become too compelling. Moral duty has weight. The duty to bear moral responsibility pulled me back into the operating room. Guy's got a mission, you know? Even when he's dying of cancer, you gotta respect that. After a month, I was operating a nearly full load. That's incredible. Stage four lung cancer on treatment needs a full neurosurgeon. Most guys work hard. Uh, 
I ended my days exhausted beyond measure, muscles on fire slowly improving, but the truth was, it was joyless. Wow. Another stable scan six months after diagnosis passed. I might have several years left. It seemed the career I had worked for years to attain, which had disappeared amid disease, was now back in reach. I could almost hear trumpets sounding a victory fanfare. You know, these remissions. People get cancer, especially a lot of cancer is curable. Stage one, two, breast, for example. These stage four cancers are a lot trickier. It all depends on which cancer it is. Some are certainly worse pancreatic than others. But with many kinds of cancer, you get treated and the cancer gets better, it shrinks, it goes away. That's called remission, when it goes in the right direction and people, and, and the cancer responds to the treatment. And so here he is, and he's responded for, it sounds like months, maybe a year, cancer went away, undetectable just like incredible. And then the human mind gets back to living. And I'm not suggesting he's, he's taking things for granted, but it gets back to, I mean, none of us get out alive. And I think with that stage four lung cancer, it's terminal. It's still, it's not curable. I wouldn't rain on his parade, but you know, he talks about in this book, he was feeling better, he was doing better, he's getting near the end of his residency, and then he started thinking about jobs and other places and this and that, and it's... It's still terminal, man. You're finding your values, that's not easy. I was suffering, but I was fully back. It's how he wanted to live, you gotta respect that. Your values are constantly changing. You try to figure out what matters. You keep figuring it out. Death may be a one-time event, but living with terminal illness is a process. On diagnosis, I'd been prepared for death. The way forward would seem obvious, only if I knew how many months or years I had left. Tell me three months, I'd spend time with family. Tell me a year, I'd write a book. Give me 10 years, I'd get back to treating diseases. The truth that you live one day at a time didn't help. What was I supposed to do with that day? It's so true. Practically matters. Yeah, if you've got three months, what would you do? How would you live? Be very different than if you've got a year and it's different how most of us live, which is assuming we've got until 80, 90 or 100. It was helpful for me to hear him struggle with his own prognosis. Now, finally, maybe I had arrived at denial, maybe total denial. Yeah, there's definitely some denial in his thinking in this book, you can see. For the last several months, I had striven with every ounce to restore my life to its pre-cancer trajectory, trying to deny cancer and any purchase on my life. The curse of cancer created a strange and strained existence, challenging me to be neither blind to nor bound by death's approach. Where was the place I wanted to plunk the remainder of my chimps? Plunk. Good word. When my notion of God and Jesus had grown, to put it gently tenuous. You know, near the end of the book, he talks about God and religion. And to be honest, and, and, and you know, he had somewhere in here, let me see. Wanna take a look, Doc? Page 174. 
he's looking at a, at a CAT scan to monitor his cancer. So periodically, every two months, six months, year, whatever you do a CAT scan and you look, is there any new cancer that's popping up? And, and so I rolled, everything looked the same. Old, tum old tumors remained exactly the same, except wait, I rolled back the images, looked again. There it was, a new tumor, large filling my right middle lobe that's of the lung so at this point his cancer has come back <clears throat> and it's gotten worse goes through continues to work and he starts to come to realization that he's probably getting close my last time scrubbing perhaps this was it so on several pages he writes about his last time in the OR we would do this one, this final closure, my way. You on call this weekend, Doc? Nope. And possibly never again. Got any more cases today? Nope. And possibly never again. On my way out to the parking lot, a fellow approached me to ask me something, but his pager went off. He looked at it, waved, turned, ran back, said, I catch you later. Tears welled up as I sat in the car, turned the key and slowly pulled out into the street. I drove home, walked through the front door, hung up my white coat and took off my ID badge. I pulled, pulled the battery out of my pager. I peeled off my scrubs and I took a long shower. It's just emotional hearing him talk about his last. Case. Talks about getting sicker, weak on cancer, kidney failure. His daughter was born. It's a tired hare who now races. I am a neurosurgeon, I was a neurosurgeon, or I had been a neurosurgeon before and will be again. It's like, who is he? Identity. Who is he if he is or isn't a neurosurgeon? Probably not. This is a great little line. And this is the end of the book. I'm gonna read these two things for you. This is as he's clearly at the end. <clears throat> and it just, it happened fast. The, the, the book, there's so much, he spent so much time on the first part of the book and then he's back at it as a neurosurgeon and then like, you can tell in the book, it just goes vroom. Like he gets sicker. He's not, doesn't have enough strength to get to writing. Everyone succumbs to, f to finite finitude. Everyone succumbs to finitude, finite. I suspect I'm not the only one who reaches this plu perfect state. Most ambitions are either achieved or abandoned Either way, they belong to the past. The future, instead of the latter toward the goals of life, flattens out into a perpetual present. Money, status, all the vanities the preacher of Ecclesiastes described holds so little interest, a chasing after wind indeed. Yet one thing cannot be robbed of her futurity, our daughter Katie. I hope I live long enough that she has some memory of me. Words have a longevity that I do not, but I had thought I could leave her a series of letters. What would they say? I don't even know what this girl will be like when she's 15. I don't even know if she'll take to the nickname we've given her. This is perhaps only one thing to say to this infant, who is all future overlapping briefly with me, whose life, barring the improbable, is still all but past. The message is simple. Ugh. It's hard to read this and not think of my daughter and, you know, go through this thing with him. When you come to one of the many moments in life where you must give an account of yourself, provide a ledger of what you have been and done and meant to the world, I do not, I pray, discount that you filled a dying man's days with sated joy, joy unknown to me in all my prior years, a joy that does not hunger for more and more, but rests satisfied in this time right now. That is an enormous thing. And that's the end of the book. And his wife concludes with a... Mm. Mm, mm, mm. There you go. That's my book review. If you want to deep, deep dive into that. For anybody still watching, 
Thanks for watching. Do you guys have any thoughts about that for the pieces that you saw? Hi, Betsy. Is that the Bible? Nope, this is not the Bible. This is, um, I'm doing a book review. This is When Breath Becomes Air by Dr. Paul Kalanithi, who is a neurosurgeon, at, who was a neurosurgeon at Stanford who got terminal lung cancer and died of it. And he wrote a book about his life and being a doctor and being a patient. And uh, we just did a little, I showed you what the book was. I just did a little book review on it, um, recommending the book if you're in the right place to listen to a doctor talk about life and death as he is, literally as he is dying over the last couple years of his life. I need a copy. Yeah, if you know, I. I had heard about this book for years and wanted to read it. Came kind of, I think, in the doctor medical world, there's a handful of books that a lot of people really like and enjoy, and this is one of them. Um, I initially kind of picked it up and put it down a couple times, and then once I got into it and he kind of built up, who is that kid up there? <laughs> and he kind of built it up, um, I, I couldn't put it down, and I read it in a, pretty much a day. So, if you're looking for a deep book, here it is. There you go. That's my book review. What do you guys think about that? What else is going on? Yeah. All right. If you guys don't have anything else, I will wish you... His daughter may not have memories of him, but can read this and know he was a man of service and amazing person. Yeah, it's a legacy for her. It tells certainly tells her about who her father was. And um, I mean, so let's see, she, she was born, I, he died in 2015. I think she was born in 14. So she's like six now. Um, you know, what would it be like to be her, not know him very well, read the book, you know, get a sense of who he is. Can't believe he went back to work. That's wildly noble. Yeah, he, you know, I, initially I was, when I read that he went back to work, I was like, you're crazy. Work's going to kill you. And and you should be spending time with family, you know, or people. Or, or I would probably work a little bit too. Um, yeah. I... You have to find your values. It, you know, so many of these lessons from this book, he had to find his values throughout what's important to him throughout his illness and death. It's no different for us in life. What's important to us now and how we live. And I think about that for me. God, what would I do? Something like that. I don't know if I would still do as much as I do now. Maybe something different. Such a great book. Ordering now. Thank you. Check it out. If um, Check it out if it resonates and if you like that kind of thing. Uh, he, he is a says finalist for the Pulitzer Surprise. P Pulitzer Prize. It's well written. It's very readable. Um, yeah. Yvonne, it's a good time to read a book on this subject. His daughter made him happy. Yeah, I think, I, I think at least for him at the end, his daughter brought an incredible amount of joy. I'm sure it wasn't easy for his wife to raise that girl without him. Um, So check it out. God, it's so hot. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go. For those of you that stuck around, mm, thanks, for, um, thanks for being a part of this. Have a good, uh, have a good evening. 
and um, catch you next time.